The next two I'm going to do together, and they're actually fairly complex. So I'm actually going to have to draw this out for you. Your abilogen levels are usually referenced to bilirubin, so it's these two that are actually used together. And there's a fairly complex path involving the liver, the small intestine, the large intestine, and then the blood supply to the kidney that actually changes how these interrelate. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to draw is just red blood cells. Or at least I'm going to try and draw red blood cells. That's probably a little bit better. Because when red blood cells are broken down by hemolysis, they create something called bilirubin, and it's called unconjugated bilirubin. Two things about this bilirubin are one, it's insoluble in water, which means it can't just float through the water. The second thing is, is it's bound up to albumin. And since albumin is not normally filtered into the urine, this won't be filtered into the urine either. So this is not the type of bilirubin that we're actually testing for on our urine strip. This unconjugated bilirubin will actually pass down, and here's where my drawing skills are really pretty weak. It will actually pass down, it's the best I can do, into the liver. And what the liver is going to do, it's going to take this unconjugated bilirubin and it's going to conjugate it. And it conjugates it to glucuronic acid, which is not really important. It just changes this bilirubin into a bilirubin, one that's soluble in water, and it's no longer bound to albumin. So this can actually end up in your urine. And a very small fraction of this, very small, and I'll draw a really small arrow, does end up in the blood. So I gotta start drawing where the blood system is going to go. And let's just draw this over to the kidney because our kidney is fairly important in this. Just draw like that. That's close enough. There's a small supply of blood that's going to head towards the kidney. But the majority of this conjugated bilirubin is going to pass down through the biliary structure and get stored in the gallbladder. Now I left a little spot there. I also want to point out that this entrance, this tube right here, is also very near the pancreas. Ooh, I always do that wrong. Right near the pancreas. And so what that means is if there's gallstones in here, and we'll get to this in a second, those gallstones can actually obscure the pancreas too or block the pancreas. We'll get there in a second. So after the liver has made this conjugated bilirubin, it'll actually go and get stored in the gallbladder along with bile, and then it'll get passed down into the intestine or the gut at some point. And let's just go ahead and make, let's just go ahead and make the gut kind of this color. Now there's bacteria in the gut convert this conjugated bilirubin to urobilinogen. Let me hit this point one more time that most of this conjugated bilirubin is going to head in this direction. There's a small amount that can go in this direction. This urobilinogen can also re-enter the blood as it's reabsorbed from the small intestine, and that could also end up in the kidneys. So there's really two paths that this conjugated bilirubin can make it into the urine. It can be passed down to the gut, converted into urobilinogen, and that will actually make it into the urine. A small, small, small amount might actually go right to the kidney and cause bilirubin to show up on the urine stick. I do want to just mention this urobilinogen is the reason feces is brown. And so if there's anything that prevents this from happening, perhaps one of the first things somebody will notice is that their stool is more of a clay color rather than brown. So 
So when you look at this, there's actually three places where things can go wrong and affect your bilirubin concentration and your urobilinogen concentration in the kidney. The first one I'm going to do is it's called a prehepatic jaundice. So jaundice is any time there's excess bilirubin in the body, it turns the skin and the eyes, it can actually ooze out of the skin and cause sheets to turn yellow. So basically things turn yellow. In this case, if there's extra hemolysis, then there's going to be extra bilirubin. But one thing about the liver is it can conjugate basically all the bilirubin that it receives. So it has plenty of capacity here. So even though excess hemolysis will cause excess bilirubin, all of that bilirubin will be conjugated, passed down into the gut, and converted to urobilinogen. So in the case of hemolysis, we actually expect a low bilirubin, and that's normal. But you've got extra urobilinogen, and so you're going to see high urobilinogen. Now another place things can go wrong is right here, is if there's some kind of obstruction, a biliary obstruction. So we're going to call this biliary obstruction. And this could occur high up in the liver. There could be a problem with the ducts actually leading to the gallbladder, or there could be an actual gallstone blocking the gallbladder itself. In this case, what's going to happen is there's not going to be the ability to pass this conjugated bilirubin down to the gut. So that means there's going to be a low amount of urobilinogen. We'll put that first. Low urobilinogen. Now since this pathway is no longer present, it naturally forces things along this, path, along this pathway, and so there can be an ele elevation of conjugated bilirubin. So we'd expect an elevation of conjugated bilirubin in the urine. Okay, so low bilirubin, high urobilinogen indicates hemolysis. High bilirubin, low urobilinogen indicates biliary obstruction. Now by far the most complex one is liver disease. And probably the easiest way to talk about this is if there's something that's altering the structure of the liver. So maybe it can actually conjugate the bilirubin, but it can't pass it down to the gut. Then what the liver is going to do in chronic cases is it'll actually hold on to this bilirubin in anticipation that it's going to be able to convert it later. Some of it might actually cause an elevation, but for the most part, the liver cannot get this conjugated bilirubin out either direction. And so what this means is bilirubin will be normal, which is low. So that's normal and urobilinogen will be low. So chronic liver disease, you have low bilirubin because it's stuck in the liver. And you also have low urobilinogen because you can't get it down to the gut. In acute liver disease, at this point there's such a destruction of the hepatocytes and there's such a destruction of the structure of the liver that those cells have no other choice but to release that bilirubin. And so you can have a very high elevation of bilirubin and low urobilinogen. That's a pretty dire circumstance at that point. The person will actually develop jaundice really, really quickly and severe liver disease can follow, severe liver failure can follow, and all the things that liver does will follow leading almost imminently to death.